that's what the law world is like. If you can imagine that space where you feel totally earthed, totally connected to nature, totally at one with nature, in fact, because we are an aspect of nature, and we nature is, has given its expression to us, through us, only we've kind of lost our way with that. So the shamanic journey into the lower world brings us back to that primal connection to nature and our connection to it. Now, a power animal is a wild animal generally. It's a bear, it's a wolf, it's a fox, it's a snake, it's an eagle. And what we're doing is we're connecting with bareness, eagleness, snakeness, fishness. You know, we become the salmon um, jumping out of the water over the waterfall. We shape shift into the, the fox, you know, moving through the forest. We become one with the pack of wolves who um, are there to help us find a way and navigate through these other worlds. So it's not just um, we meet a fox or we meet a, a, a dog or we meet a wolf or we meet a bear. We, be, we become one with the essence of those animals. Now, those animals are there to guide us and help us because if you think about it, um, if you want to, you know, be smarter in terms of a negotiation strategy in a meeting, who are you going to go and talk to? The fox. Because the fox is sly and she's wily and she knows how to get into these places and, and be smart. If you want to get a, an overview of a situation in your life that's giving you trouble, who are you going to go to? You're going to go to the eagle. You get, and the eagle sees everything. They fly over, they have eagle eyes, they spot things at a distance. Stangroff originally began working with um, LSD-25 psychedelics um, because he saw them as non-specific uh, non amplifiers or catalysts of, of the unconscious. In other words, what was within the person would be brought to the surface by use of the, the LSD. Now, this is very much similar, very much the same as what shamans have been doing for tens of thousands of years with ayahuasca psilocybin, you know, mescaline, um, all sorts of other alkalines um, and, and substances. And we even go back as far as, um, you know, ancient China and, and the Middle East with the use of cannabis was used in this way as it is in India today by the sadhus um, to induce these yogic or deep states. So now we see what's happening in the world is a revival of psychedelic medicine. Um, lots of people now are looking at microdosing with these substances in order to enhance their well-being, lift depression, reduce anxiety, and alleviate the stress of everyday life. And then others are taking deeper dive journeys, um, going deep into their own personal conscious um, and, uh, and, and catharting deep complexes that are locked within their unconscious that Ivor Brown, the Irish psychiatrist, calls the frozen past uh, or the unexperienced experiences. And the interesting things happen here because it, it has a direct link to what you see in indigenous cultures where the, the Kong Bushmen, for example, will dance for three days, three nights, <clears throat> and then when they come back, they release what they call the noom um, and have a major catharsis, and then they lay their hands on um, people in the community that to help them heal. So that's an example of a shamanic drum beat that brings you into that ordinary, non-ordinary state. You know, the drumming journey usually lasts about uh, 20 minutes, a half an hour or longer, depending on how far or deep you want to go. And then when it's time to come back, we give you the callback signal. So whenever we are doing shamanic healing work, it's always very important to open sacred space, to call in the spirit guides, have an altar set up, and so that you're embedding and imbuing the energy into the space. So for example, you know, shamans, you often see them, shamanic practitioners, to start, I like to start in the east. And when you beat this 
Take this rattle. It's like those crystal and sacred stones spark off each other, generating energy so that when you're when you're using it around a person's aura or the bioenergy field has them lying on a, on a mattress, it's moving that energy up and through their um, shackles. And you can also use it for doing extraction work. Sometimes when I'm doing extraction work, I use the rattle and then I'll use it like a, like a, a, a psychic scalpel to attach the intrusion and pull it out like that. Otherwise, I do it with my hand. In some cultures, they do it by sucking the extraction out. Not as something we teach on, on a course of this or basic work through. It's very specialized work because you have to really know what you're doing when you're sucking an extraction out that you don't take it on into your own self. Sometimes, um, we lose part of our souls. And from a shamanic point of view, this is seen as a pretty serious problem because um, in indigenous cultures, if somebody went through a trauma or a shock or they came back from a war situation, the shaman would do a soul retrieval right away. And this is what happens. Soul loss happens because um, it's a survival strategy. Because if we were fully present to the situation that is causing us stress or pain in this time, whether it was child sexual abuse, um, the loss of a relationship, a road traffic accident, trauma, you know, people in war situations, refugees, all that kind of thing, there's a shock to the system. People go into survival mode. Now, from a shamanic point of view, what I said, the soul part splits off and it fragments and it journeys into the other world, often to find a safe place where it can be nurtured and cared for. And it's fascinating when, when I do a soul retrieval how, how, how that works. And the reason is that it preserves the joyful, happy, you know, beautiful side of yourself that um, might have got damaged or traumatized by if you had stayed in that place where the trauma was happening to you. And then you can go through your life not really knowing that part of your soul is missing. And you're, you're looking everywhere for it, but all in the wrong places. Now, when I do a soul retrieval for somebody, which is actually most of the work I do in one-to-one -one sessions, because soul loss is endemic in our culture. Um, none of us um, have escaped that uh, malady because whether it be from, you know, family trauma, um, abuse in our, in our childhood, bullying at school, you know, difficult relationships, um, being in accidents or um, having illnesses, or just a general wear and tear of everyday life. We all suffer from soul loss. And in fact, as, as a culture, as a society, um, there's a collective soul loss. And that's an interesting phenomenon. If you look at cultures that have been dominated by, by imperialist states or invaded by other countries or taken over, you take the, the Scots, the Irish, the Native Americans, the Aboriginals in Australia, the, the, the Maori people. What you find is um, the collective soul loss happens when their language is taken away. Their music, their culture, their traditions, their shamanic ways of working often are the, one of the first things that is um, taken away because it's about disempowering the individual. I find when I do a soul retrieval and I put the person lying on, on the couch, and they rattle in the directions. I call in my spirit guides and, and, and theirs. And um, I'll open the heart chakra and the crown chakra, and then I'll start beating the drum. And when I'm doing individual sessions, I like to teach the client to journey too. So I'll give them the rudimentary instructions of how to journey. Then I'll get them journey to the Lord to meet their power animals, and because I'll be doing the live drumming. So then I take off on the journey and I go into the lower world often and I meet my power animals, my guides, and I'll say, I'm here for John. He's lost part of his soul. He's feeling empty. He's depressed. Life's not working for him. And um, often what will happen, several things, I'm quite fascinating. Um, if I'm working for women, I'm usually taking the sleeve Nikalia, which is the hill of the old woman, the goddess here, very close to Dunleary Park dedicated to the, to the Irish goddess. And she brings me into a place in non-ordinary reality where she has a beautiful cairn, like a, a, a cave, set up. And she works there with two she-women, two fairy women, two beautiful, tall, 
elvish type women. And I will see the energetic body of the woman I'm working for in that space being worked on and healed by the Kalyuk and the two she women. That's the point I want to make here today, uh, on one level, that it's not just about death itself. It's about the ego death or dying to ourselves and being reborn. But in terms of the shamanic idea of death and working with death, the shaman uh, is a midwife for the soul in the sense that in traditional cultures, the shaman would work with the person who is dying and escort their souls from this life into the afterlife, making sure they get across safely. So this panoramic life review is not something we should dread at the end of our days, but it's not something we should wait for in the end of our days either. One of the journeys we do on the practitioner's course is we take a journey to the moment of our death, where we have a near-death experience in the company of our guides, and we live through the whole thing as if we were dying in that moment, and we do the panoramic life review, so extraordinary what people come back with, and how it changes the way they think about their lives from there on in. Another thing we do is what we call the scroll of directions. That is, we take a journey into the afterlife. You see, the shamans have no fear of death because they're very much familiar with where we go after we die because they spend a lot of their time journeying over and back into the other worlds, into non-ordinary reality, into the spirit world or the dream time, as some shamans call it. And they become familiar with that place that we go to after we die. So what, one of the journeys we take is to set up what we call a scroll of directions, to journey back and forth and mar mark out the landscape of the afterlife. Take a moment now to set your intention. I'm going on a journey to beat my power animals and my spirit guides to ask for help and healing with something that ails me. And when the drumming starts, just let yourself go in through the mind's eye, down into that beautiful place of nature, connect with a power animal, which is a wolf or a bear or a fox or an eagle. These animals are the embodiment of the power of that animal and speak directly to them. Some of you may be taken to the upper world, which is a celestial kind of heavenly realm where you meet your ancestors and your spirit guides or the she fairy folk. Whatever happens, let it happen. And when you meet them, say, I'm, I'm here to ask for help and healing. Agus nei an er, an trolin an shau agus an aler. Glei mid sher an bandi a bridge, bandi an in sparoida agus filiakta. Tar, tar es jack agus falcha. I mean, Jung said the shadow was ninety nine percent gold, and he meant by that was that all our oppressed positive talents and energies are being repressed there because your mother told you you couldn't sing the teacher of school said you were useless at this so you pushed it away you buried it in your 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 shadow because you thought you were no good at that and also you know possibilities that you don't know you have um, are, are, are lodged in the shadow so when you do shadow work um you get to know yourself better you get to know all the repressed parts of yourself so you're not projecting them all out into the world as Jung said if you want to help humanity the best thing you can do for it is to withdraw your own projections and deal with them, burn them within yourself. And actual fact, the burning of the projections and burning of the shadow fuel gives you energy then to raise your vibra vibrational frequency to ever higher levels. That's how it works. Burn karma, get fuel, get the rocket, go higher in, on your spiritual journey.